gods, men, and beasts, hearing the message of deliverance, received and understood it in their own language. And when the doctrine was propounded, the venerable Kandana, Theoeldiest one among the five Bhikkhus, discerned the truth with his mental eye, and he said, Truly, O Buddha, our Lord, thou hast found the truth. Then the other Bhikkhus too, joined him and exclaimed, Truly, thou art the Buddha, thou hast found the truth. And the Devas and Saints and all the good spirits of the departed generations that had listened to the sermon of the Tathagat, joyfully received the doctrine and shouted, Truly, the Blessed One has founded the Kingdom of Righteousness. The Blessed One has moved the earth, he has set the wheel of truth rolling, which by no one in the universe, be he God or man, can ever be turned back. The Kingdom of Truth will be preached upon earth, it will spread, and righteousness, good will, and peace will reign among mankind. 17 The Sangha having pointed out to the five bhikkhus the truth, the Buddha said, A man that stands alone, having decided to obey the truth, may be weak and slip back into his old ways. Therefore, stand yet together, assist one another, and strengthen one another's efforts. Be like unto brothers, one in love one in holiness, and one in your zeal for the truth. Spread the truth and preach the doctrine in all quarters of the world, so that in the end all living creatures will be citizens of the kingdom of righteousness. This is the holy brotherhood, this is the church, the congregation of the saints of the Buddha, this is the Sangha that establishes a communion among all those who have taken their refuge in the Buddha. And Kandana was the first disciple of the Buddha who had thoroughly grasped the doctrine of the Holy One, and the Tathagat looking into his heart said, Truly, Kandana has understood the truth. Hence the Venerable Kandana received the name Anatta Kandana, that is, Kandana who has understood the doctrine. Then the Venerable Kandana spoke to the Buddha and said, Lord, let us receive the ordination from the Blessed One. And the Buddha said, Come, O Bhikkhus! Well taught is the doctrine. Lead a holy life for the extinction of suffering. Then Kandana and the other Bhikkhus uttered three times these solemn vows, To the Buddha will I look in faith, He, the Perfect One, is holy and supreme. The Buddha conveys to us instruction, wisdom, and salvation, he is the Blessed One, who knows the law of being, Hayes the Lord of the world, who yokes men like oxen, the teacher of gods and men, the exalted Buddha. Therefore, to the Buddha will I look in faith. To the doctrine will I look in faith, well preached is the doctrine by the exalted one. The doctrine has been revealed so as to become visible, the doctrine is above time and space. The doctrine is not based upon hearsay, it means come and see, the doctrine leads to welfare, the doctrine is recognized by the wise in their own hearts. Therefore to the doctrine will I look in faith. To the community will I look in faith. The community of the Buddha's disciples instructs us how to lead a life of righteousness. The community of the Buddha's disciples teaches us how to exercise honesty and justice. The community of the Buddha's disciples shows us how to practice the truth. They form a brotherhood in kindness and charity, and their saints are worthy of reverence. The community of the Buddha's disciples is founded as a holy brotherhood in which men bind themselves together to teach the behests of rectitude and to do good therefore, to the community will I look in faith. And the gospel of the Blessed One increased from day to day, and many people came to hear him and to accept the ordination to lead thenceforth a holy life for the sake of the extinction of suffering. And the Blessed One seeing that it was impossible to attend toll who wanted to hear the truth and receive the ordination, 
sent out from the number of his disciples such as were to preach the Dharma and said unto them, the Dharma and the Vinaya proclaimed by the Tathagat shine forth when they are displayed, and not when they are concealed but let not this doctrine, so full of truth and so excellent, fall into the hands of those unworthy of it, where it would be despised and contemned, treated shamefully, ridiculed and censured. I now grant you, O Bhikkhus, this permission. Confer henceforth in the different countries the ordination upon those who are eager to receive it, when you find them worthy. Go ye now, O Bhikkhus, for the benefit of the many, for the welfare of mankind, out of compassion for the world. Preach the doctrine which is glorious in the beginning, glorious in the middle, and glorious in the end, in the spirit as well as in the letter. There are beings whose eyes are scarcely covered with dust, but if the doctrine is not preached to them they cannot attain salvation. Proclaim to them a life of holiness. They will understand the doctrine and accept it. And it became an established custom that the bhikkhus went out preaching while the weather was good, but in the rainy season they came together again and joined their master, to listen to the exhortations of the Tathagat. 18 Yasa, the youth of Banaras at that time there was in Banaras a noble youth, Yasa by name, the son of a wealthy merchant. Troubled in his mind about these arrows of the world, he secretly rose up in the night and stole away to the Blessed One. The Blessed One saw Yasa, the noble youth, coming from afar. And Yasa approached and exclaimed, Alas! What distress! What tribulations! The Blessed One said to Yasa, Here is no distress, here are no tribulations. Come to me and I will teach you the truth, and the truth will dispel your sorrows. And when Yasa, the noble youth, heard that there were neither distress, nor tribulations, nor sorrows, his heart was comforted he went into the place where the Blessed One was, and sat down near him. Then the Blessed One preached about charity and morality. He explained the vanity of the thought I am, the dangers of desire, and the necessity of avoiding the evils of life in order to walk on the path of deliverance. Instead of disgust with the world, Yasa felt the cooling stream of holy wisdom, and, Having obtained the pure and spotless eye of truth, he looked at his person, richly adorned with pearls and precious stones, and his heart was filled with shame. The Tathagat, knowing his inward thoughts, said, Though a person be ornamented with jewels, the heart may have conquered the senses. The outward form does not constitute religion or affect the mind. Thus the body of a Samama may wear an ascetic's garb while his mind is immersed in worldliness. A man that dwells in lonely woods and yet covets worldly vanities, is a worldling, while the man in worldly garments may let his heart soar high to heavenly thoughts. There is no distinction between the layman and the hermit, if but both have banished the thought of self. Seeing that Yasa was ready to enter upon the path, the Blessed One said to him, Follow me. And Yasa joined the Brotherhood, and having put on a bhikkhu's robe, received the ordination. While the Blessed One and Yasa were discussing the doctrine, Yasa's father passed by in search of his son, and in passing he asked the Blessed One, Pray, Lord, hast thou seen Yasa, my son? And the Buddha said to Yasa's father, Come in, sir, thou wilt find thy son, and Yasa's father became full of joy and hindered. He sat down near his son, but his eyes were holden and he knew him not, and the Lord began to preach. And Yasa's father, understanding the doctrine of the Blessed One, said, Glorious is the truth, O Lord. The Buddha, the Holy One, our Master, 
sets up what has been overturned, he reveals what has been hidden, he points out the way to the wanderer who has gone astray, he lights a lamp in the darkness so that all who have eyes to see can discern the things that surround them. I take refuge in the Buddha, our Lord, I take refuge in the doctrine revealed by him, I take refuge in the brotherhood which he has founded. May the Blessed One receive me from this day forth while any life lasts as a lay disciple who has taken refuge in him. Yasa's father was the first lay member who became the first lay disciple of the Buddha by pronouncing the threefold formula of refuge. When the wealthy merchant had taken refuge in the Buddha, high seas were opened and he saw his son sitting at his side in Abhikha's robe. My son, Yasa, he said, thy mother is absorbed in lamentation and grief. Return home and restore thy mother to life. Then Yasa looked at the Blessed One, and the Blessed One said, Should Yasa return to the world and enjoy the pleasures of our elderly life as he did before? And Yasa's father replied, If Yasa, my son, finds it again tossed with thee, let him stay. He has become delivered from Thebo and age of worldliness. When the Blessed One had cheered their hearts with words of truth and righteousness, Yasa's father said, May the Blessed One, O Lord, consent to take his meal with me together with Yasa as his attendant. The Blessed One, having donned his robes, took his alms bowl and went with Yasa to the house of the rich merchant. When they had arrived there, the mother and also the former wife of Yasa saluted the Blessed One and sat down near him. Then the Blessed One preached, and the women having understood his doctrine, exclaimed, Glorious is the truth, O Lord! We take refuge in the Buddha, our Lord. We take refuge in the doctrine revealed by him. We take refuge in the brotherhood which has been founded by him. May the Blessed One receive us from this day forth while our life lasts as lay disciples who have taken refuge in him. The mother and the wife of Yasa, the noble youth of Banaras, were the first women who became lay disciples and took their refuge in Thbuddha. Now there were four friends of Yasa belonging to the wealthy families of Banaras. Their names were Vimala, Subhu, Punnaji, and Gavampati. When Yasa's friends heard that Yasa had cut off his hair and put on bhikkhu robes to give up the world and go forth into homelessness, they thought, surely that cannot be a common doctrine, that must be a noble renunciation of the world, if Yasa, whom we know to be good and wise, has shaved his hair and put on bhikkhu robes to give up the world and go forth into homelessness. And they went to Yasa, and Yasa addressed the Blessed One, saying, May the Blessed One administer exhortation and instruction to these four friends of mine. And the Blessed One preached to them, and Yasa's friends accepted the doctrine and took refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Nineteen Kassapa at that time there lived in Uravel the Jatilas, Brahmin hermits with matted hair, worshipping the fire and keeping a fire dragon, and Kasapa was their chief. Kasapa was renowned throughout all India, and his name was as one of the wisest men on earth and an authority on religion. And the Blessed One went to Kasapa of Uravel, the Jatala, and said, Let me stay a night in the room where you keep your sacred fire. Kasapa Seeing the Blessed One in His Majesty and Beauty, thought to himself, This is a great Muni and a noble teacher should he stay overnight in the room where the sacred fire is kept, the serpent will bite him and he will die. And he said, Edo not object to your staying overnight in the room where the sacred fire is kept, but the serpent lives there, he will kill you and I should be sorry to see you perish. But the Buddha insisted and Kasapa admitted him to the room where the sacred fire was kept. 
and the Blessed One sat down with his body erect, surrounding himself with watchfulness. In the night the dragon came to the Buddha, belching forth Iyanaraj his fiery poison, and filling the air with burning vapor, but could do him no harm, and the fire consumed itself while the world honored one remained composed. And the venomous fiend became very wroth so that he died in his anger. When Kisipa saw the light shining forth from the room he said, Alas, what misery! Truly, the countenance of Gotama the great Sakyamuni is beautiful, but the serpent will destroy him. In the morning the Blessed One showed the dead body of the fiend to Kisipa, saying, His fire has been conquered by my fire. And Kisipa thought to himself, Sakyamuni is a great Samama and possesses high powers, but he is not wholly like me. There was in those days a festival, and Kisipa thought, that people will come hither from all parts of the country and will see the great Sakyamuni. When he speaks to them, they will believe in him and abandon me. And he grew envious. When the day of the festival arrived, the Blessed One retired and did not come to Kisipa. And Kisipa went to the Buddha on the next morning and said, Why did the great Sakyamuni not come? The Tathagat replied, Didst thou not think, O Kisipa, that it would be better if I stayed away from the festival? And Kisipa was astonished and thought, Great is Sakyamuni, Hekin read my most secret thoughts, but he is not wholly like me. And the Blessed One addressed Kisipa and said, Thou southeastest the truth, but acceptest it not because of the envy that dwells in thee heart. Is envy holiness? Envy is the last remnant of self that has remained in thy mind. Thou art not holy, Kisipa, thou hast not yet entered the path. And Kisipa gave up his resistance. His envy disappeared, and, bowing down before the Blessed One, he said, Lord, our Master, let me receive the ordination from Tin. Blessed One. And the Blessed One said, Thou, Kisipa, art chief of the Jatilas. Go, then, first and inform them of thine intention and let them do as thou thinkest fit. Then Kisipa went to the Jatilas and said, I am anxious to lead a religious life under the direction of the great Sakyamuni, Hoi the Enlightened One, the Buddha. Do as ye think best. And the Jatilas replied, We have conceived a profound affection for the great Sakyamuni, and if thou wilt join his brotherhood, we will do likewise. The Jatilas of Uravel now flung their paraphernalia off fire worship into the river and went to the Blessed One. Nadi Kisipa and Gay Kisipa, brothers of the great Uravel Kisipa, powerful men and chieftains among the people, were dwelling below on the stream, and when they saw the instrument sus in fire worship floating in the river, they said, Something has happened to our brother and they came with their folk to Ravel. Hearing what had happened, they, too, went to the Buddha. The Blessed One, seeing that the Jatilas of Nadi and Gay, who had practiced severe austerities and worshipped fire, were now come to him, preached a sermon on fire, and said, Everything, O Jatilas, is burning. The eye is burning, all the senses are burning, thoughts are burning. They are burning with fire of lust. There is anger, there is ignorance, there is shatred, and as long as the fire finds inflammable things upon which it can feed, so long will it burn, and there will be bird hand death, decay, grief, lamentation, suffering, despair, and sorrow. Considering this, a disciple of the Dharma will see the four noble truths and walk in the eightfold path of holiness. He will become wary of his eye, wary of all his senses, wary of his thoughts. 
he will divest himself of passion and become free. He will be delivered from selfishness and attain the blessed state of nirvana. And the Jatilas rejoiced and took refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. XXThe Sermon at Rajagaha and the Blessed One having dwelt some time in Uravel went forth to Rajagaha, accompanied by a great number of Bhikkhus, many of whom had been Jatilas before, and the great Kisapa, chief of the Jatilas and formerly a fire worshipper, went with him. When the Magadha king, Siniya Bimbisra, heard of the arrival of Gotama Sakyamuni, of whom the people said, He is the Holy One, the Blessed Buddha, guiding men as a driver curbs bullocks, theater of high and low, he went out surrounded with his counselors and generals and came to the grove where the Blessed One was. There they saw the Blessed One in the company of Kisapa, the great religious teacher of the Jatilas, and they were astonished and thought, Has the great Sakyamuna placed himself under the spiritual direction of Kisapa, or has Kisapa become a disciple of Gotama? And the Tathagat, reading the thoughts of the people, said to Kisapa, What knowledge hast thou gained, O Kisapa, and what has induced thee to renounce the sacred fire and give up thine austere penances? Kisapa said, the prophet I derived from adoring the fire was continuance in the wheel of individuality with all its sorrows and vanities. This service I have cast away, and instead of continuing penances and sacrifices I have gone in quest of the highest nirvana. Since I have seen the light of truth, I have abandoned worshipping the fire. The Buddha perceiving that the whole assembly was ready as Avicel to receive the doctrine, spoke thus to Bimbisra the king, he who knows the nature of self and understands how the senseucht, finds no room for selfishness, and thus he will attain peace unending. The world holds the thought of self, and from this arises false apprehension. Some say that the self endures after death, some say IDP or Ishas. Both are wrong and their error is most grievous. For if they say the self is perishable, the fruit they strive for will perish too, and at some time there will be no hereafter good and evil would be indifferent. This salvation from selfishness is without merit. When some, on the other hand, say the self will not perish, then in the midst of all life and death there is but one identity unborn and undying. If such is their self, then it is perfect and cannot be perfected by deeds. The lasting, imperishable self could never be changed. The self would be lord and master, and there would be no use in perfecting the perfect, moral aims and salvation would be unnecessary. But now we see the marks of joy and sorrow. Where is any constancy? If there is no permanent self that does our deeds, then there is no self, there is no actor behind our actions, no perceiver behind our perception, no lord behind our deeds. Now attend and listen, the senses meet the object and from their contact sensation is born. Thence results recollection. Thus, as the sun's power through a burning glass causes fire to appear, so true the cognizance born of sense and object, the mind originates and with it the ego, the thought of self, whom some Brahmin teachers call the Lord. The shoot springs from the seed, the seed is not the shoot, both are not one and the same, but successive phases in a continuous growth. Such is the birth of an imitated life. Ye yeah, that are slaves of the self and toil in its service from morn until night, ye yeah, that live in constant fear of birth, old age, sickness, and death, receive the good tidings that your cruel master exists not. Self is an error, an illusion, a dream. Open your eyes and awaken. See things as they are and ye will be comforted. 
He who is awake will no longer be afraid of nightmares. He who has recognized the nature of the rope that seemed to be a serpent will cease to tremble. He who has found there is no self will let go all the lusts and desires of egotism. The cleaving to things, covetousness, and sensuality inherited from former existences, are the causes of the misery and vanity in the world. Surrender the grasping disposition of selfishness, and you will attain to that calm state of mind which conveys perfect peace, goodness, and wisdom. And the Buddha breathed forth this solemn utterance, Do not deceive, do not despise each other, anywhere. Do not be angry, nor should ye secret resentment bear, for as a mother risks her life and watches o'er her child, so boundless be your love to all, so tender, kind and mild. Yea, cherish good will right and left, all round, early and late and without hindrance, without stint, from envy free and hate, while standing, walking, sitting down, whatever you have in mind, the rule of life that's always best is to be loving kind. Gifts are great, the founding of Vihars is meritorious, meditations and religious exercises pacify the heart, comprehension of the truth leads to nirvana but greater than all is loving-kindness. As the light of the moon is sixteen times stronger than the light of all the stars, so loving-kindness is sixteen times more efficacious in liberating the heart than all other religious accomplishments taken together. This state of heart is the best in the world. Let a man remain steadfast in it while he is awake, whether he is standing, walking, sitting, or lying down. When the enlightened one had finished his sermon, the Magadha king said to the Blessed One, In former days, Lord, when I was a prince, I cherished five wishes. I wished, oh, that I might be inaugurated as a king. These was my first wish, and it has been fulfilled. Further, I wished, might the Holy Buddha, the Perfect One, appear on earth while I rule and might he come to my kingdom. This was my second wish and it is fulfilled now. Further I wished, might I pay my respects to him. This was my third wish and it is fulfilled now. The fourth wish was, might the Blessed One preach the doctrine to me, and these is fulfilled now. The greatest wish, however, was the fifth wish, might I understand the doctrine of the Blessed One. And these wishes fulfilled too. Glorious Lord! Most glorious is the truth preached by the Tathagat. Our Lord, the Buddha, sets up what has been overturned, he reveals what has been hidden, he points out the way to the wanderer who has gone astray, he lights a lamp in the darkness so that those who have eyes to see may see. I take my refuge in the Buddha. I take my refuge in the Dharma. I take my refuge in the Sangha. The Tathagat, by the exercise of his virtue and by wisdom, showed his unlimited spiritual power. He subdued and harmonized all minds. He made them see and accept the truth, and throughout he kingdom the seeds of virtue were sown. 21 The kings gift the king having taken his refuge in the Buddha, invited the Tathagat to his palace, saying, Will the Blessed One consent to take his meal with me tomorrow together with the fraternity of Bhikkhus?